They're getting lighter, Megan, but they're getting fatter. Today, we're going to be addressing the elephant in the room with regards to the world's most popular peptide nowadays, semaglutide. Why is it that multiple health personalities are sharing with the media that there is this dark side, where people who use it lose a disproportionately high amount of muscle? Dr. Peter Atia has addressed it on multiple podcasts and on television. Derek from More Plates More Dates shared his thoughts on it. A lot of the talk comes down to the significant weight loss that accompanies GLP-1 agonism use. And they are not wrong, but I think there is this big piece of this conversation that's missing, and that is discussing that how they work physiologically may be a large contributing factor as to why Dr. Atiyah's findings may be the way they are. But before we dive into their videos, if you haven't already, just give us a like and subscribe. I recently added a $4.99 a month feature for members only, for those who are interested in further supporting the channel financially, and I will be dropping member-only videos and eventually adding a Patreon as well, with further features and building this community that is awesome. Regardless if you join or not, I appreciate all of you as always. Either way, I'm still going to be diving into peptide research, new and old, and sharing with you the risks, benefits, and what we know. Quick plug aside, let's get into the video. Hey everyone, I want to talk about a drug that I am getting asked about nonstop. I mean, I don't think a day goes by that a, a friend, acquaintance, or a patient is asking me about Ozempic, which also goes by the name semaglutide. Um, and, and, and Wigovi is technically the brand that people are referring to for this purpose. Anyway, Ozempic or semaglutide, Wigovi, is a class of drug called a GLP-1 agonist. And it is uh, really right now the prototype weight loss drug. Now, this is a drug that's been around for a little while. So I don't know exactly what changed in the past couple of months, but um, not why I'm doing this video. Why I'm doing this video is to caution those of you who think this drug is a panacea that you should use for weight loss uh, to be aware of a very important consideration. So um, this is mostly predicated on the following. We have used this drug clinically in a number of patients. Does it work? Yes, it does work. This is a profound appetite suppressant, and it seems to do so safely. There are, have been no shortage of other drugs in the past that have suppressed appetite, but they have done so with some really negative side effects. For example, some of them are stimulants. You've got, of course, FenFen, which is its own category of potential uh, damage. Uh, this drug works centrally, and it works really effectively. It also has the benefit of improving glycemic control, and it does that quite effectively as well. In fact, the first iterations of semaglutide were used in patients with type 2 diabetes. It's been rebranded as Wigovia uh, as, a, as a drug for weight loss, uh, and it's dosed slightly differently. But for all intents and purposes, when you think Ozempic, you're really thinking at this point appetite suppression. Okay, so the drug works. So you're saying, Peter, well, if it drug helps me lose weight because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat less and I'm going to improve glycemic control. And I think it's doing that in two mechanisms. I think it's doing that through the actual weight loss. Anytime you lose weight, you're going to become more insulin uh, sensitive, but it's also a direct insulin sensitizer. So we're seeing these profound ways to improve glycemic control in both regards. What could be wrong with it? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. Almost without exception, every patient we've put on this drug has lost muscle mass and they have lost it at a rate that alarms me. So it's not uncommon if you weigh 200 pounds and you go down to 180 pounds that you're gonna lose some muscle, some fat. But let's be clear, if you lost 10 pounds of muscle and 10 pounds of fat to go from 180 to 200, would that be good? Well, only if you were more than 50% body fat at the outset. Otherwise, you've disproportionately lost muscle to fat. In fact, you've gotten fatter as you've lost weight. That's not what we want. And yet that's what we're seeing happen over and over and over again. So much so that in our practice now, we've basically drawn a line in the sand and said to patients, if we have exhausted all other dietary options and we're going to really consider using Ozempic, you must have a DEXA scan first and we must have really clear uh, guidelines for what's happening. Furthermore, we uh, work closely with patients to make sure that if they're on these drugs, that they understand that their protein requirements do not change. So if you're at 200 pounds and your target weight is you know, 180 pounds, you're still gonna be consuming 
200 grams per day of protein, and you're going to be working out. So Dr. Atia is the first person who brought this concern to the public eye, and he does a good job addressing it. It can't be said that data explicates this point, but there is value in anecdote, and I do cherish Peter's POV with regards to metabolic health, as that is the focus of a lot of his practice. And as a preface, I think unchanged protein requirements is smart for anybody undergoing weight loss. If it's within an adequate caloric profile, of course, because muscle preservation is a metabolically crucial component of insulin sensitivity. And Wegovy, the version of semaglutide branded for weight loss in its FDA label, reports its use should be adjunctive to physical activity. Now let's get into some of Derek's insights. Now, is the outcome of the weight loss generally going to be a positive thing for hemoglobin A1C metrics, fasting glucose, etc., etc.? Yes, you are going to see improvements in biomarkers when you lose weight. However, there are certain individuals that have a disproportionate loss in muscle, even bone in some cases too, and it essentially goes overlooked because the actual target endpoints in these studies, they are looking at net weight loss outcomes, not necessarily lean body mass relative to fat mass relative to, like this is not something that is segregated in a way that is representative of good versus bad weight loss. It is just what is the outcome. And that is a more dramatic headline, obviously too. If you know, you're a pharma company who's trying to highlight how potent your stuff is, you want to show the total amount of pounds lost you don't care if it's <laughs> where it's coming from necessarily as much when you're just trying to beat, you know, the other pharmaceutical company that has a certain amount of pounds lost. You don't give a shit, really. As long as you lost more pounds than them, you are going to get more hype, more uh, glamorization in the media, more uh, overall sales and money and revenue. So one of the people who is most outspoken about this is uh, Peter Atia. He has gone on uh, Megyn Kelly's show, as well as talked about it on The Drive, his own personal podcast as well. A lot of the people who are using these drugs and are getting prescribed them are people who have lost, you know, 20, 30 plus pounds, like 15, 20% of their body mass entirely is what some of these study metrics are showing being lost. And when you factor in how much of that is lean mass, metabolically active tissue, helpful tissue <laughs> versus actual fat mass that you're trying to get rid of in a targeted manner, ideally, the net outcome of it being a proportionally higher loss of the tissue that is otherwise sought after and makes you more capable of avoiding the negative ramifications of any sort of presence of, you know, the, the bad mass, ultimately losing muscle or bone. These are not necessarily good things in natural, not you know, mega enhanced bodybuilder populations. Wow. So they're getting lighter, Megan, but they're getting fatter. So basically they're becoming skinny fat, which in individuals who are already basically showing that they do not necessarily have the healthiest relationship with food to have reached some sort of body composition that is representative of something that is a viable candidate for a obesity management drug that is like the most nuclear approach you could be using essentially you can see how this could be a slippery slope and a vicious circle which i'll do my best to elucidate shortly because if you end up just losing a disproportionately high amount of muscle it is not necessarily a net benefit despite the fact that you might be decreasing the intake of you know unhealthy foods that got you into a predicament where you have you know morbid obesity to begin with the problem with a compound like this is it suppresses your appetite very significantly to a point where a you might otherwise decrease your calorie intake so significantly that you're losing weight faster than you would have otherwise during a controlled dieting phase where you could otherwise proportionally preserve more lean tissue than during an aggressive cut. Like the more you crash diet, the more you are setting yourself up to lose lean tissue ultimately. A lot of what Derek dives into are the drug's side effect profile as well as the incidences of increased heart rate. I think at the heart of this conversation lies in semaglutide's mechanism when compared to the role of insulin in a healthy person. A lot of people placed on semaglutide, whether obese, diabetic, or both, likely suffer from an extent of insulin resistance, which is essentially a state characterized by poor metabolic health where the body's regulation of glucose is important 
impaired. High levels of circulating glucose over a long period of time promote increased release of insulin, which therein lies the nature of resistance. Semaglutide operates on a trifold mechanism that intertwines within this metabolic pathway. It stimulates pancreatic release of insulin, decreases glucagon release, and notably slows gastric emptying, which is likely responsible for the gastrointestinal side effects people report. On Derek's channel, he frequently discusses that muscle mass is metabolically active. Skeletal muscle is indeed metabolically active tissue in that in periods of energy need, it can utilize glucose and fatty acids as fuel. And it's no secret that resistance training provides metabolically beneficial effects, which is purportedly due to multiple factors, including increases in vascularity that could contribute to increased allowance of oxygen, nutrition, and insulin to muscles. Now, insulin release is beneficial for muscle maintenance as well. It regulates carbohydrate metabolism to increase rate of glycogen synthesis while preventing its breakdown and increases the uptake of triglycerides into fat and muscle cells, as well as helping to bring amino acids into tissues, assisting protein synthesis while preventing its degradation. So by nature of insulin resistance, it's not unlikely that those with diabetes lack a favorable balance of lean body mass to fat and likely cannot maintain muscle as well as someone with a better metabolic profile. Hence why insulin itself is considered anabolic. All of this together makes Atiyah's anecdotal discovery, which has gained him quite a bit of attention, questionable. Because insulin is anabolic, wouldn't we expect these individuals to better maintain muscle in the setting of continued resistance training? The answer is yes. So why is it that people on semaglutide may lose muscle mass? This in part, theoretically at least, could have to do with the obesity paradox, and that strength in obese persons may be greater than what we think. Larger presence of fat could come with larger muscles due to the body's anti-gravity resistance training it performs on a daily basis. Think about it, although there are certainly long-term negative mobility effects to obesity amongst many other things, for a period of time the body has to work to sustain the mass and it's fighting against adiposity and gravity. And these findings are not unfamiliar to research. So in people who lose a significant amount of weight with semaglutide, my guess based on the data is that Atiyah's fear is both grounded and a bit presumptuous. And by that I mean losing significant amount of weight and improving metabolic biomarkers is honestly good for long-term health. I think these people lose muscle not just because they're not eating and are likely devoid of adequate protein intake, but also due to the fact that the body no longer has to carry around all this weight. I feel like everyone on Ozempic should be monitoring protein intake. I don't think everyone will be getting DEXA scans beforehand due to its cost prohibitive nature and it's not really par for the course with most clinicians out there in starting semaglutide. But consuming unchanged protein allowances should be doable. And I would guess that if these people lose weight, fat, and muscle, and return to resistance training, they will find that they were more easily build and maintain muscle due to the increased insulin sensitivity that comes with semaglutide use and restoration of healthy metabolism. This is just my take. I'm sure some will debate it, and semaglutide isn't without risk, but I don't think that worry, with regards to muscle loss initially at least, should be completely prohibitive. Of course, the older the person, the more we worry about muscle loss and immobility fracture, and what have you, especially in people with chronic medical conditions that could be affecting all of this, but I hope this video helps shed some light on these public concerns and what I make of it. All in all, thank you very much for watching. As always, please give us a like and subscribe. I've noticed some creeping up there who are pretty much just using ChatGPT to formulate information on peptides, but you have my word. I'll continue to read the research and get into the details, and I hope you've been enjoying these videos in the channel. Thank you. Take care.